This is your cat. This is your cat on postmodern neo-Marxism. Any questions? This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! We are continuing on with the Let Children Skateboard rule, even though that original advice is so far off in the distance that it has slipped down past the horizon at this point. I've been putting off doing this in the intro for some time, but subscribe, please. Roughly 40% of you aren't, and it would mean a lot to me if you could just click the little subscribe guy. Thanks. With that awkwardness out of the way, let's review the visual shorthand for the different voices in this video before getting on with the patriarchy. This means I'm paraphrasing the book. This means I'm responding to the book. And this is for science. All one paper in this video. Okie doke. Let's get back to letting the patriarchy skateboard. That's not right. Right off the bat, Stern Peterson is back. Of course, culture is an oppressive structure. It's always been that way. It's a fundamental, universal, existential reality. The tyrannical king is a symbolic truth, an archetypal constant. What we inherit from the past is willfully blind and out of date. It's a ghost, a machine, and a monster. It must be rescued, repaired, and kept at bay by the attention and effort of the living. It crushes as it hammers us into socially acceptable shape, and it wastes great potential. We're pausing mid-thought because I want to point out that he's echoing ideas from earlier in the book. Our ancestors knew what was up, we're just not able to appreciate and live their truth fully. Tradition is good, and we should go along with it. We have to be shaped by society, almost destructively, before we can be competent, and we have to keep our ancestors' traditions alive, lest we fall into a chaos dragon pit. I almost feel like the scene towards the end of 1984 with the main character in the situation feels apt. Hammer off all those parts of you that don't fit the mold so you can continue on in society as dictated to us by tradition. Doesn't matter what shape a peg you are, you're going to fit that square hole, bucko. But why does culture have to function this way? Why does it have to hammer out all the quirks and uniqueness? Throwing you at me is not a satisfactory answer. But culture offers great gain, too. Every word we speak is a gift from our ancestors. Every thought we think was thought previously by someone smarter. The highly functional infrastructure that surrounds us, particularly in the West, is a gift from our ancestors. The comparatively uncorrupt political and economic systems, the technology, the wealth, the lifespan, the freedom, the luxury, and the opportunity. Yeah, having a language to share ideas and communicate with is pretty cool, although I don't know if I'd call it a gift from our ancestors. But of course, there's some negative, put you in your place, you're not so smart stuff happening here too. If this was the case, that every thought had already been thought by someone smarter, how would advancement in any field work? The people way back when would have already invented flying cars and cured cancer. It's an absurd statement. Also, Tell me, Peterson, who was the smarty pants who had the idea naked wombat dance party before me? Newton? Aristotle. This whole thing reads like further instructions from Peterson not to go futzing with culture as it is now because it's such a lovely present from our great 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 Grammy Maws. I know it doesn't fit, but you need to put it on when she comes over later. She works so hard on it. Culture takes with one hand? But in some fortunate places, it gives more with the other. To think about culture only as oppressive is ignorant and ungrateful, as well as dangerous. This is not to say, as I am hoping the content of this book has made abundantly clear so far, that culture should not be subject to criticism. I don't disagree that some people may think of the West's culture as totally oppressive with no benefits. However, this seems like he's violating his rule of accurately portraying the opposition's argument by painting cultural critics with the same broad brush. However, however, I do have to note that that isn't what's being directly said here, although it definitely seems like the implication. 
Something that'll get lost in the nuance mix is that there's more to culture than just the patriarchy. But Peterson's focus here is on the patriarchy and other dominance hierarchies. Finally, Peterson does do a fair bit of cultural criticism in this book, yes. But it's mostly progressives, postmodern neo-Marxists, and other people ideologically opposed to him. Can't talk about the patriarchy without talking about dominance hierarchies. Consider this as well in regard to oppression. Any hierarchy creates winners and losers. The winners are, of course, more likely to justify the hierarchy and the losers to criticize it. He then argues that trying to accomplish anything will result in a hierarchy, as some people will be better at that thing than others. And trying to accomplish things is what gives life meaning, although these things are not specified. This reminds me, strongly, of one of the alt-right playbooks videos on a possible fundamental difference in worldview between the right and the left. Over here in Lefty Land, I question the fundamental truism of what Peterson's arguing for here. Yeah, people will sort out in different abilities on whatever, and some people will be better at the whatever than other people, but that doesn't mean that the people better at this thing get to use their betterness against the people less good at the whatevering. But it's possible, maybe even likely given Peterson's love of the dominance hierarchies, that he takes these as an integral part of life. He even says that life wouldn't have meaning without these. I'm not sure if this was his intent with the winners and losers bit, but the inference could be made that progressives working to change the power structures are just losers, upset at not being higher up in the hierarchy. Which would fit in with his interpretation of Orwell's Herotwig and Pierre from earlier this chapter that the social reformer types were trying to change things strictly because they hated the rich. Throwing in the value coding of winning and losing is an interesting choice. Why be good at anything or try to get better at something unless you can be better than other people while you're doing it? Seems like the kind of mindset that led to... Defeating the naysayers. You're either winning or you're losing. There's nothing in between. In thinking through this, my initial thoughts was that this might stagnate a growth mindset, but further reflection, no. Although a person in this mindset would probably try to improve themselves to be a winner, or at least not a loser. So much for that rule of not comparing yourself to others. We experience almost all the emotions that make life deep and engaging as a consequence of moving successfully towards something deeply desired and valued. <laughs> That almost in this quote is, quite frankly, a cop-out. He always has to leave himself these little trap doors so that he can argue against interpretations of what he's saying. Yes, our brains reward us with good feels when we accomplish something, but I guess the negative emotions of failure aren't invited to this party. But some deep and engaging emotions are independent of goals. Why do we engage with the arts and entertainment? Hopefully the answer isn't some sims like increment of a trait, but to experience something beautiful, or thought-provoking, or even funny. There's even the profound experiences that come from negative things, like the loss of a loved one. This is part of the point of his next rule. The price we pay for that involvement is the inevitable creation of hierarchies of success, while the inevitable consequence is difference in outcome. Absolute equality would therefore require the sacrifice of value itself, and then there would be nothing worth living for. We might instead note with gratitude that a complex, sophisticated culture allows for many games and many successful players, and that a well-structured culture allows the individuals that compose it to play and to win in many different fashions. Recall from the last 12 rules video that games are an ill-defined something that boys and girls play, separately, and that Peterson expressed concern that higher ed, particularly the humanities, were becoming a girl's game. At this point, he's arguing that these hierarchies are necessary and inevitable, and that your place on them is your own doing. This will definitely be more clear by the end of this. But I do have to admit that some of this is jiving with my personal experience. As discussed in previous videos, I spent a several year stretch without a job, and in that time, I did try to pick up some skills and whatever, but most of the time was just to do whatever I wanted. And at first, having all day every day to play video games was fun, but 
without something to do, goofing off kind of lost all meaning. However, we're getting the first hints of the equal opportunity versus equal outcome stuff that's going to show up later in this chapter. It's possible this gratitude note is alluding to systems where people were stripped of choice in what they would do. I once met an older Russian chemist who spent the first half of her life in Soviet Russia, and she didn't want to be a chemist. They wanted her to be a chemist. So she became a PhD chemist. So it is great that we can pick our own path to the extent we can. Peterson seems to be glossing over that the hierarchy we're born into impacts what path we're able to choose and where we sort out. Class, race, gender, so on. The complex, sophisticated culture that I think he's saying we live in now does indeed have differences in outcome, but they're not solely the products of our efforts. I'm just picturing a scenario with a bunch of kids sitting around playing something like Smash Brothers, and the host kid has the nice controller, and the other kids are trying to make do with the shitty controllers. And the parent pops their head in after hearing a bunch of THAT'S NOT FAIR for some time, realizes that their kid's being a spoiled brat, and insists that either that good controller gets shared among everybody, or nobody gets a good controller. And now that kid's throwing a tantrum because it's not fun to play now. Strange how the abundance of citations we saw in the last section have dried up. It is also perverse to consider culture the creation of men. Culture is symbolically, archetypally, mythically male. That's partly why the idea of the patriarchy is so easily swallowed. But it is certainly the creation of humankind, not the creation of men, let alone white men who nonetheless contributed their fair share. Why would culture be symbolically, archetypally, mythically male, Peterson? Would it have something to do with, oh, I don't know, the people in charge being men? I don't think the existence of the patriarchy necessitates that the culture was created by men. Big Daddy Peterson talking about swallowing the patriarchy. European culture has only been dominant, to the degree that it is dominant at all, for about 400 years. On the timescale of cultural evolution, which is to be measured, at minimum, in thousands of years, such a time span barely registers. Ah uh, yes. Two psychologists discussing anthropology and the like. I'm sure this isn't going to miss any nuance whatsoever. 400 years? Okay, sure, but look at all the shit that's happened. Colonization, extermination, ecological devastation. Just because it's a short time period doesn't mean it hasn't had a huge impact. Also, why the European focus here? It's not like the West has the patriarchal market cornered. Furthermore, even if women contributed nothing substantial to art, literature, and the sciences prior to the 1960s and the feminist revolution, which is not something I believe, then the role they played raising children and working on the farms was still instrumental in raising boys and freeing up men, a very few men, so that humanity could propagate itself and strive forward. This is like the wordier version of behind every great man is a great woman. Gotta love the traditional role for women. Huge ups. Thanks for raising the babies and letting men go off and do their manly stuff that moves society forward. Mm. And I know that this is how it was for a lot of history for a lot of people. But that doesn't mean that these women weren't under the authority of the men in their lives. You know, oppressed? Here's an alternative theory. Throughout history, men and women both struggled terribly for freedom from the overwhelming horrors of privation and necessity. Women were often at a disadvantage during that struggle, as they had all the vulnerabilities of men with the extra reproductive burden and less physical strength. Uh-huh. But on top of the lower quality of life, Women also had to put up with the serious practical inconvenience of menstruation, the high probability of unwanted pregnancy, the chance of death or serious damage during childbirth, and the burden of too many young children. Perhaps that is sufficient reason for the different legal and practical treatment of men and women that characterized most societies prior to the recent technological revolutions, including the invention of the birth control pill. At least such things might be taken into account before the assumption that men tyrannize women is accepted as a truism. So all that time women were, sometimes still are, 
assumed to be dumber and of lesser legal standing is because they pop out babies and are physically weaker. Super. Also, something that will become more apparent as we keep going, Peterson doesn't seem to get that trying to affect social change with regard to the patriarchy isn't just for the benefit of women. It's for everyone. Even in this quote, the examples he gave, it's not just the women who are impacted by this. Unwanted pregnancies, too many mouths to feed, would impact the woman's partner, too. It looks to me like the so-called oppression of the patriarchy was instead an imperfect collective attempt by men and women stretching over millennia to free each other from privation, disease, and drudgery. Using so-called in this manner could be read as suggesting that the oppression isn't real. Guess what arguments come in next? He puts forward the tampon king of India, the advent of medical anesthesia, especially in childbirth, and Tampax tampons as demonstrative that men weren't oppressing women. Did the inventor men oppress women or free them? What about Gregory Goodwin Pincus, who invented the birth control pill? In what manner were these practical, enlightened, persistent men part of a constricting patriarchy? Peterson's two-category thinking is popping up again. It's possible for these men to have improved women's lives and have been part of the patriarchy at the same time. Like, he thinks it's impossible for the patriarchy to be a thing because some men help some women at some point. Like, hey honey, I know you've been just working so hard washing our clothes by hand, so I bought you a washing machine. No patriarchy. But here's the thing. Those men were part of the patriarchy. Peterson's part of the patriarchy. I'm part of the patriarchy. Especially because Peterson hasn't bothered to define what he means by patriarchy. From his arguments, I'd imagine his definition would be as broad as along the lines of a social system that oppresses women. Although the broad definitions I've seen are more about power, and that power being in the hands of men, but, you know, who needs specifics? Regardless, we live in a culture that has historically, preferentially given power to men over women, and there's still consequences and norms floating around from that. Even something relatively benign, like a woman modifying or changing her last name when she gets married. Why is it almost exclusively women who do this when they get married, Peterson? Why do we teach our young people that our incredible culture is a result of male oppression? It's been a bit since I was in primary school or any school, so things may have changed drastically since then, but what? The first and only time I was taught about feminism was at the end of 10th grade and it was just a, hey, this is the thing that happened and that was it because it was the end of the semester and we were out of time. and. I didn't hear about the patriarchy until I was in grad school, so in my 20s. And I do have to give the caveat that my undergrad was a STEM school and we had less than 10 faculty in the humanities department. But in talking with other people who went to substantially larger schools, patriarchy is something that usually needs some elaboration. Although watching TikTok compilations, don't judge, no one likes a judge. And it can be a bit of a meme among the youths, so they're at least aware of the concept. Although the way it gets memed seems to be contingent on their ideological beliefs. You've got some edgelords who are fully embracing the awesomeness of the patriarchy with things like make me a sandwich. And then you've got other edgelords who want most men just exterminated. You have to keep that breeding population after all. And then everything in between. And so it seems like Peterson's claim about what kids are being educated isn't quite accurate. This has come up before, but it's possible to celebrate the good aspects of something while working to change the less good aspects. And this is certainly true for culture. Just because we have some holdovers from the historical way of doing things that aren't really meshing with the modern progressive way we'd like the world to work, doesn't mean we have to throw out the entire culture. Although, while looking for something else, I did find a quote from Rule 8 that may give us some insight into Peterson's reticence in social change. Perhaps he views the patriarchy as irrevocably bound up in the West culture, so changing some part of it would require abandoning all of it. But that's just speculation. Peterson lists off some academic disciplines, 
largely in the humanities plus law, that actively treat men as oppressors and men's activity as inherently destructive. And he says that these push radical political action as part of the curriculum. His examples are a women's studies department in Carleton that encourages activism, not specified in what, and a gender studies department at Queens that, quoting a quote, teaches feminist, anti-racist, and queer theories and methods that center activism for social change, end of the quote in the quote, indicating support for the supposition that university education should, above all, foster political engagement of a particular kind. Maybe it's something he opted to not include or reference, but I'm not seeing the anti-man bias in what is here. And I know it can exist. The legal system can sometimes be biased against men in custody hearings for kids after a divorce. But even that is a consequence of the patriarchy. This assumption that the kids need to go with the mom because dads can't parent. The patriarchy isn't always working in the best interests of men. Also, there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. Peterson seems to be working from the assumption that students who go into these majors are being pushed into political activism. But it seems like another explanation is that students who go into these majors were already interested in being politically active if they weren't already doing activism already. And it seems more likely to me that students going into these majors would be doing it because it's an interest of theirs. For as much as he's talked about postmodern neo-Marxism out in the wild, its section, at least for its own little special section, takes up less than a page in the book. Let me remind you again, dear viewer, that I'm not a philosopher, or an economist, or anything of that like. If you want to figure out something about somebody's attention, I'm your doc. But this? Nope. 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 Arguably. Neither is Peterson. The Zizek Peterson Marxism debate was a lovely demonstration of that. All that being said, Peterson wrote about it in this book, so we're going to cover it. For actual discussions of this, check out channels like Philosophy Tube or Cup Philosophy. Peterson says that the previously mentioned disciplines are influenced by many sources, especially the Marxist humanists. His examples are Max Horkheimer, developer of critical theory, and Jacques Derrida described as the leader of the postmodernists. Then Peterson shifts to talking about Marx. Marx attempted to reduce history and society to economics, considering culture the oppression of the poor by the rich. When Marxism was put into practice in the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, and elsewhere, economic resources were brutally redistributed. Private property was eliminated, and rural people forcibly collectivized. The result? Tens of millions of people died. Hundreds of millions more were subject to oppression rivaling that still operative in North Korea, the last classic communist holdout. The resulting economic systems were corrupt and unsustainable. The world entered a prolonged and extremely dangerous Cold War. The citizens of those societies lived the life of the lie, betraying their families, informing on their neighbors, existing in misery without complaint, or else. Something to be careful with for any field or theory that has a name attached to it is the distinction between its original conception of the person who wrote it and the subsequent modifications to it over time. I tried to make this distinction in my Freud and Jung videos that I was talking about Freud and Jung's work and not what subsequent depth psychologists have done with it. Marxism, as it is today, is different from when Marx wrote it. Also, with regard to Marxism, the Soviets went through several iterations of isms inspired by Marx's work. Originally, it was Leninism. Over time, that became Stalinism, then de-Stalinization. And of course, I'm not saying that horrible things didn't happen in trying to change a country's economy from the top down. They did. And North Korea is the state embodiment of human rights violations. But holding up any of these countries as examples for why Marxism can't work, doesn't work. No state has 100% implemented a Marxist or even a socialist government yet. Marxist ideas were very attractive to intellectual utopians. 
Marxist ideals can be attractive when the bad practices of capitalism are fucking shit up. Pearson's example is the Sorbonne-educated Q. Sampon, who is in the leading group of the Khmer Rouge. His doctoral work, according to Peterson, argued that non-farming work was unproductive. This was then applied when the Khmer Rouge took power in Cambodia and forced everyone into collective farming. As Peterson did last time, he talked about the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. He's blaming the intellectuals for what went down, completely missing or ignoring the fact that the regime was anti-intellectual to the point of a purge. I hate splitting hairs like this, but Peterson does include that a quarter of the Cambodian population was killed under the Khmer Rouge, but leaves out the part where any sort of intellectual was part of that outside of Pol Pot's inner circle. Indulge me with a slight tangent. Thank you in advance. A potential rabbit hole to investigate is the whole situation around McCarthyism and the American propaganda films from the 1950s about communism. The concern about the Cold War escalating to a hot one is understandable, especially given the mutually assured destruction philosophy of the time. But there was a general distrust of people who either directly supported communism or Marxism, or were associated with trying to affect social change. It was un-American, and a great way to get blacklisted out of jobs. I bring this up because it seems like Peterson's lengthy discussion of the horrors and failures of the different types of communism with the intellectual utopians here and what's coming later seems to be playing a familiar tune. Communism is bad. Postmodern neo-Marxism is a continuation of communism. It's threatening the West. It's threatening you. Peterson covers the early history of the USSR, including that they helped fight against the anti-fascist government in the Spanish Civil War. But he says this was to draw attention away from the anti-Kulak campaigns back home. The parasitical Kulaks were, in general, the most successful and hardworking farmers. A small minority of people are responsible for most of the production in any field, and farming proved no different. Agricultural output crashed. What little remained was taken by force out of the countryside and into the cities. Six million people died of starvation in the Ukraine, the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, in the 1930s. A more complete history of the Kulaks and the horrific things that happened to them can be found online. I'm not disputing any of that. However, Peterson's explanation for the food supply crash seems to be ideologically driven. The de first gathered up the wealthier peasants, seized their property and produce, then sent the people off to horrible treatment and or death. But with that done, the surviving farmers, who were more productive than their neighbors, could be accused themselves of being a kulak and receive the same punishments. This was a huge disincentive to be as productive as they could be, and that's part of why the food shortage happened. There's a lot of factors in this. A lot. And for a more thorough explanation of that, check out the link. My point. It wasn't just that the farming hierarchy got disrupted, leaving the lesser skilled farming lobsters behind trying to do the same work. This was a complex situation that revolved around more than just the skill of the kulaks. Peterson says that the world's general opinion on communism was, at the time, pretty favorable, despite some knowledge of what was going on behind the Iron Curtain especially among Western intellectuals, especially in France. Then there's some stuff about Sartre being a communist slash Marxist, and then, of course, Solzhenitsyn concluding that part with, No one could stand up for communism after the Gulag Archipelago, not even communists themselves. Peterson is once again interchanging communism with Marxism, Stalinism, and many other isms. These systems have their differences, so to hold up critiques of Stalinism to Marxism, or even socialism, doesn't make sense. Now we get to the part where Peterson shows his hand for why he spent many pages talking about the USSR. This did not mean that the fascination Marxist ideas had for intellectuals, particularly French intellectuals, disappeared. It merely transformed. Some refused outright to learn. Sartre denounced Solzhenitsyn as a dangerous element. Derrida, more subtle, substituted the idea of power for the idea of money and continued on his merry way. Such linguistic sleight of hand 
gave all the barely repentant Marxists still inhabiting the intellectual pinnacles of the West the means to retain their worldview. Society was no longer repression of the poor by the rich. It was oppression of everyone by the powerful. This idea continues to be explored for a bit, but one sec. Peterson's pulling together two recurring threads from this book. Dominance hierarchies are an undeniable fact of life, and Marxism is bad. Although, it's weird how power and money tends to go together. Part of Marxism is that we should own the fruits of our labor, and we should collectively try to be successful, rather than accumulating fruits, some not of our own labor, and punching down to maintain our spot on the dominance hierarchy. According to Derrida, hierarchical structures emerged only to include the beneficiaries of that structure, and to exclude everyone else who were therefore oppressed. Derrida claimed that divisiveness and oppression were built right into language, built into the very categories we use to pragmatically simplify and negotiate the world. The categories Peterson includes are men excluding women, males and females excluding people with amorphous biological sex, science only benefiting scientists, and politics only benefiting politicians. To elaborate a little bit, there's sort of a duality to these categories and a power dynamic. So men are not women, and men are superior to women by exclusion. In Derrida's view, hierarchies exist because they gain from oppressing those who are omitted. It is this ill-gotten gain that allows them to flourish. If you can cite the lines from Xenophon for the trial and death of Socrates, you can give me a book title or essay or something for where you're getting your ideas about Derrida's philosophy. In checking in with the philosophy friends on my Discord server, it seems that Peterson isn't drastically mischaracterizing Derrida's work at this point. His focus seemed to be more literary, but still. However, I'm not finding some of these particular examples in the summaries online, so I can't say if the amorphous biological sex is Derrida or Peterson. Before I forget, the description box is loaded with links about Derrida and postmodernism in general because there's a lot to this. That's beyond my scope. Derrida famously said, although he denied it later, Il n'y a pas de hausse texte. Often translated as, there is nothing outside the text. His supporters say that is a mistranslation and that the English equivalent should have been, there is no outside text. It remains difficult, either way, to read the statement as saying anything other than everything is interpretation, and that is how Derrida's work has generally been interpreted. Come on, Peterson. I would think you could relate to Derrida here. Writing something that's vague enough that has your supporters arguing that others aren't reading it right? Peterson doesn't provide further context for this statement, so here's the Cliff Notes version. It seems to boil down to a given word or concept not existing in isolation, but in a larger context of what it's not. I'm sitting in a chair. A chair is different from a bench and a stool. And technically, this is a gaming chair. But gaming chairs have a lot of overlap with computer chairs. So at what point does a computer chair become a gaming chair? Like, where's the boundaries? Ta-da! And all that's going to cost you is liking the video. That's better than free, right? All of that doesn't seem terribly nihilism-inducing. It is almost impossible to overestimate the nihilistic and destructive nature of this philosophy. It puts the act of categorization itself in doubt. It negates the idea that distinctions might be drawn between things for any reasons other than that of raw power. Biological distinctions between men and women? Despite the existence of an overwhelming, multidisciplinary scientific literature indicating that sex differences are powerfully influenced by biological factors, science is just another game of power for Derrida and his postmodern Marxist acolytes making claims to benefit those at the pinnacle of the scientific world. There are no facts. Hierarchical position and reputation as a consequence of skill and competence? All definitions of skill and of competence are merely made up by those who benefit from them to exclude others and to benefit personally and selfishly. We know Peterson loves his two-box categorization approach to everything, so somebody coming along and questioning that would probably be an existential threat. 
make me get rid of my tube box system? My universe will cease to make sense. Doom spiral it is, no alternative. I'm not sure why Peterson is this focused on Derrida, other than he was a postmodernist who dared to criticize categories in the West. And I could be wrong, but I don't think Derrida really went into biology like Peterson does here. Although it does seem like this is a sore spot for Peterson, so it's only natural they'd go back to the thing that started this whole Peterson phenomenon in the first place, his fundamental category of male and female. It's something that he appears to assume that postmodernists believe that science is a power game. Understanding any of this is like playing 5D chess, I swear. Although, this is the first appearance of the meritocracy idea that will be fleshed out later. Moving on. There is sufficient truth to Derrida's claim to account, in part, for their insidious nature. Power is a fundamental motivational force. A, not B. People compete to rise to the top, and they care where they are in dominance hierarchies. But, and this is where you separate the metaphorical boys from the men, philosophically. The fact that power plays a role in human motivation does not mean that it plays the only role, or even the primary role. Uh-huh. And? Also, just because power plays a role in motivation doesn't mean this is something that we should just embrace without question. It also doesn't mean that the powerful get to use their power without question. Likewise, the fact that we can never know everything does make all our observations and utterances dependent on taking some things into account and leaving other things out, as we discussed extensively in Rule 10. That does not justify the claim that everything is interpretation or that categorization is just exclusion. Beware of single-cause interpretations and beware the people who purvey them. Beware indeed, little lobsters. Peterson warns the reader that different interpretations of facts are not equivalent. Some can hurt, some can lead down anti-societal paths, and some are just not going to work out in the long term. He describes some as being more hardwired than others, but notes that the number of possible interpretations outnumber viable solutions. If this wasn't the case, life would be easy. The raw, unparaphrased version isn't more comprehensible or clear. Peterson notes he has some left-leaning views. What? I kid. His example is somewhat funny given what we've been talking about in this section, the income disparity. But he says that even though this is a problem, the solution isn't self-evident and trying to fix it may make things worse. He mentions attempts in the West, namely the Swedes and the US, as being opposite approaches to this problem. But because of the many differences between the countries, a clear-cut answer hasn't materialized. But it is certainly the case that forced redistribution in the name of utopian equality, is a cure to shame the disease. Granted, Peterson isn't directly pointing his finger at any particular ism here, but in the context of this chapter, I want to point out that this wasn't part of Marxism. It certainly happened in some attempts at non-capitalistic societies, but that wasn't Marx. Okay, so we agree that the financial gap is an issue. What would you suggest, since you're bringing it up? Hearing a lot of complaints and critiques, but not a lot of ideas. Right now, it sounds like the idea is to do nothing. Because that's just how financial dominance hierarchies work themselves out. Especially in the larger context of the book, where readers have been repeatedly discouraged from tampering with society or culture. Other self-identified leftish stances of Peterson's. Running universities like a business is a mistake. Science of management isn't a discipline, and the government can be useful in some situations. Normally, hard pivots don't happen mid-paragraph, so I guess Peterson's mixing it up for us. Nonetheless, I do not understand why our society is providing public funding to institutions and educators whose stated, conscious, and explicit aim is the demolition of the culture that supports them. Such people have a perfect right to their opinions and actions, if they remain lawful, but they have no reasonable claim to public funding. If radical right-wingers were receiving state funding for political operations disguised as university courses, as the radical left-wingers clearly are, 
the uproar from progressives across North America would be deafening. Demolition of the culture is a pretty extreme description of what the majority of progressives want, even in academia. This funding decree is pretty rich, coming from Dr. Jordan Dragons to Exist, Peterson. Dr. Jordan. I don't know what neither means, because I don't know what the options are if you're not a man or a woman. It's not obvious to me how you can be both, because those are, by definition, binary categories. There's an idea that there's a gender spectrum, but I don't think that that's a valid idea. I don't think there's any evidence for it. Biological sexuality is ancient. It's hundreds of millions of years old. And it's binary because there's two forms of, 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 of biological sex. Now, of course, this is predicated on the idea that your gender is somehow independent from your, from your biological sex, but that's a proposition, not a fact. Even if it in some manner was determined to be true, it is certainly not determined to be true to that degree now, and certainly not to the degree that it should be instantiated in law. At most, it's an opinion, and I think it's an ill-informed opinion. Peterson. Speaking of, why do you think you've gotten some of the pushback you have, Peterson? I even have an example of what Peterson's talking about, although it's in the primary school level and not university, but I would think that would mean it matters more. You know how in some schools in the US, creationism is taught as a valid alternative to evolution, and the uproar that happened in response to that starting to happen, including the founding of several religious movements? There are other serious problems lurking in the radical disciplines, apart from the falseness of their theories and methods, and their insistence that collective political activism is morally obligatory. There isn't a shred of hard evidence to support any of their central claims. That Western society is pathologically patriarchal? That the prime lesson of history is that men, rather than nature, were the primary source of the oppression of women, rather than as in most cases, their partners and supporters. That all hierarchies are based on power and aimed at exclusion. Hierarchies exist for many reasons, some arguably valid, some not, and are incredibly ancient evolutionarily speaking. Do male crustaceans oppress female crustaceans? Should their hierarchies be upended? The crustaceans return for a reducto ad absurdum argument that's also an appeal to nature. That's a threefer. If he's so concerned about these radical disciplines, why not call them out here? Are these the same that were listed off as viewing men as inherently destructive earlier? Be clear and precise. Dr. Dragons are real because Jung has a super stable foundation to be throwing poorly founded research stones from. He says that this not specify they don't have evidence, but where's his? He slipped up in the last couple sections by showing he can reference as much as I'm requesting. So where's the receipts now, chief? If it was just nature oppressing women, why has the women's rights movement followed the timeline it has? In the traditional Christian household relationship model that's been gaining in popularity recently, the man is the head of the household and the wife is subservient to him. He may support her. He has to support her. He may even call her his partner, but his word is law. She is under his control because the culture of an old book says to do this. Peterson argues that functional societies are meritocracies. Higher status people are more competent. His example is picking a brain surgeon, saying you wouldn't refuse the services of someone with the best education, reputation, or salary. Then he brings in intelligence as a personality trait, predictor of long-term success in the West. Hey guys, so I was doing the final proof for this video before hitting rendered, and I remembered that the online version of the 12 rules I've got, the numbering in the end notes is off. And so yeah, I was talking about the wrong paper, so I owe you guys a couple paper discussion at the start of the next video. Peterson goes to some lengths to say that the relationship between intelligence and success is among the strongest that social sciences has ever seen, without providing any sort of citation or evidence. None. And so, because state-funded schools have postmodern neo-Marxist instructors, thus, 
Not only is the state supporting one-sided radicalism, it is also supporting indoctrination. We do not teach our children that the world is flat. Neither should we teach them unsupported, ideologically predicated theories about the nature of men and women or the nature of the hierarchy. Yet. We're not teaching our children that the world is flat. Yet. The whole creationism intelligent design thing in the U.S. has certainly demonstrated that it's not out of the realm of possibility for us. And... okay. I'm sure you can probably guess what the unsupported, ideologically predicated theories about the nature of men and women is referring to. Those schools sure are indoctrinating our kids with the LGBT agenda. Mm. And yeah, that's where we're going to leave it for this video. There's only so much I can handle at one time. And... I would hate for the equal outcome stuff that's coming up in the very near future to be lost in with all these nuggets of wisdom. So until next time, bye.